Sage Creek this morning, and we welcome those who are now joining us either on television or on the radio, whether you're in Virginia or Tennessee or southeastern Kentucky. We're glad to have you with us here at Tate's Creek Baptist Church for today's worship time. I get real excited when I hear about the creative ways that our church members share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And we have one of our church members who uh, likes to work with glass, and I notice that quite often you'll be coming out of the auditorium and I will see certain jewelry and I'll say, let me guess, that's a Don Adkins. And uh, sure enough, normally that's the case. And uh, by the way, if he's not giving you any, be sure and hunt him down. Say, hey, you didn't give me any of that jewelry. But um, he likes to make crosses out of the glass. And a lot of you wear the cross necklace. And a lot of us guys have a cross we keep in our pocket that he's made. And this morning in Sunday school, one of our ladies who not long ago gave her life to Christ and was baptized here at Tate's Creek was at her home and a family member came in. And the family member noticed that she had on a necklace with a cross, the same one Don Adkins had made for her. And this family member began to talk to her about that cross. And finally, after the conversation, he bowed his head and gave his heart to Jesus. Amen. And so we give praise to the Lord for that. Amen. So we're excited when people come to know the Lord as their Savior and the way God is using our folks. It's just beautiful to watch people come to Jesus. And here at Tate's Creek, we believe in laying a strong foundation in the Word of God. And we're going through the Bible now, and we are now in Matthew chapter 13. And so I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And as we come to this chapter, we're taking a little bit of a turn at this point in the teachings of Jesus Christ. As you know, we began in Matthew uh, with the birth of Jesus and Jesus coming on the scene, and he began to teach. And a lot of people didn't have a problem with Jesus as long as he was teaching about loving your neighbors and loving each other and being kind to people, as long as he talked about a person's character and integrity. They didn't have a problem with that. But where Jesus lost a large amount of audience was when he began to tell them who he really is, that he is God, that he is the Savior of the world. And they began, the religious crowd began to reject him as the Savior and as God. And to this day, there are a lot of religious folks who deny Jesus is God and deny him to be the Savior of the world. There are religions in this day, other religions, even Islam, who do not have a problem with the teachings of Jesus as long as he's teaching about love and kindness and goodness to one another. But they have a real hard time with the fact when Jesus began to say that he is God and that he is the Savior of the world. And so what happened was, in context of where we are now in Matthew 13, you want to remember that prior to this, in the last messages, we were looking at how the religious crowd was rejecting Jesus. He had taught them about uh, receiving Him. He had been healing the sick, casting out demons. And they rejected Him when He uh, said that He did that because of His authority as God. So they began to reject Him. And you'll remember in the last message, we defined about what it meant to commit the unpardonable sin. And the unpardonable sin, remember, is not murder, it's not suicide, it's not child abuse. The unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin Jesus taught us was when we allow our hearts to become so hardened that we can no longer sense the Holy Spirit of God teaching us. And it's unpardonable because you're unable to repent when your heart becomes that hard. And so in context of all of this, Jesus takes a turn. From this point on, he no longer teaches the crowds of people as he was teaching them. From this point on, Jesus begins to teach the crowds by the use of what is called parables. He will continue to teach his disciples alone in teachings. But when he's speaking to the crowds, he begins now to speak to them in parables. A parable literally means to throw alongside. You know what a parallel bar is. You know how that... 
uh, train tracks run parallel with each other. And so a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so what Jesus begins to do at this point, and we're going to see 48 parables in the Gospels, what Jesus begins to do at this point is he will take stories that people can relate to. For example, if he was speaking to a crowd of police officers today, he might use a story about a police officer went to this situation, and he would teach them a spiritual truth. In the parable we're getting ready to look at, he uses a parable that David and our farmers could relate to because now he's going to give to us an agricultural parable to help them to understand because a lot of the people that he was speaking to knew what it was to grow a crop and to plant seeds and to, and to reap a harvest. And so Jesus begins to teach them in this parable. Now I will encourage you strongly to come back for our six o'clock service Because at 6 o'clock, we're going to answer the question, why did Jesus speak in parables? It is a question that he was asked uh, in verse 10, why do you speak to us in these parables? So come back tonight and we'll talk about why Jesus did this. Why did he start teaching people in parables? So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 13. The Bible says that that same day, what day? It was the same day that he had taught them earlier when he had healed sick and cast out demons and taught them about what the unpardonable sin was. It was that same day, the Bible says, that Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea. The Bible goes on to say that great crowds began to gather around him there on the shore of the sea. There were so many people that the Bible says Jesus got in a boat And the crowds gathered on the beach. And so now you got the picture. They're by the sea. There's a large crowd of people on the beach. And Jesus is standing in a boat. Now he begins to teach them. Here's what the Bible says that he taught them as a parable. Jesus said that there was a sower that went out to sow seed. And uh, as he sowed... Some seeds fell among the path. Now, they understood about the path because in ancient times, in ancient Palestine, there was no interstate, there was no roads going up and down for people to drive on. They obviously didn't have cars. And so there were a lot of paths. And if you've ever been on a path, you know that the more people walk on these paths, the harder the path becomes. And so Jesus is picturing to us now a path that people would be walking on. Here I go. I'm going to have to use this. And so he went out to sow, and as he sowed, there were some seeds that fell on that path. On that hard path, the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now mark this in your notes, verse 9, He who has ears, let him hear. Now Jesus has just given to us this first story parable. Remember, he's going to tell us something earthly that we can relate to. It's as though Jesus said, okay, when you went to Walmart yesterday and you saw these people dressed kind of funny, you know, I mean, he was telling them an earthly story that they could relate to, to teach them a heavenly meaning. And so here's the picture. There are three symbols that Jesus used in this story. There was the symbol of the seed, There was the symbol of the sower who was casting the seed, and there's a symbol of the soil. So how do we know what Jesus is talking about? Well, of the 48 parables that we will see in the Gospels, there are two of them in which Jesus interpreted for us. He was helping us out. And so I believe that the reason he interprets this one for us is because this is the first one that he will use as we go through the Gospels, and I think he wanted to teach us how to interpret these parables. And so if you go down to verse 18, Jesus begins 
to interpret for us what he's talking about when he's talking about the seed, the sower, and the soil. Now let's look at verse 18. Jesus said, hear then the parable of the sower. Now he's going to interpret it. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom. Now that is what we see as the seed. The word of the kingdom. The seed is the word of God. And so when Jesus talks about casting the sower casting the seed, he's telling us that that seed is the word of God. It is what he was speaking at the time. It is what we're saying when we go out and talk to people about Jesus. That's the word of God. Now, the word of God has a lot of parallels to the seed. Because you ask yourself, why would Jesus use a seed to describe to us the Word of God. Well, it's easy to understand when you think about what a seed does. For example, a seed has life in it. It has the potential of producing life. And in the Word of God, there is life. It is a living Word of God. You can lay the Bible down on a table along with several other books, and even though they might look the same laying on the table beside each other, there's a difference between the Bible and the rest of the books. I love to read. I read a lot of books. I have so many books in my library that this past week we had to add six bookshelves just to get them up off the floor. I mean, I got a lot of books and I like to read. And so there's a difference, though, between all of these books, hundreds of books that I have in my library and this Bible. And the difference is the Bible is a living word. It is the living word of God. There is life. It's like a seed that produces a harvest. It's like a seed that produces life. When you obey what the Word of God says, there is life that comes from that. And, and looking at the Bible, if you just laid it again out on a table by other books, it might look like another book, but there's a difference. Even though it might look small, it is a powerful Word of God. There is power found in what God says and what the Word of God teaches us. The other thing that is like a seed with the Word of God is that it produces fruit. It changes your life. When you obey the Word of God, you are changed and there's a difference in your life when you do what God tells you to do. It also must be planted. It must be cultivated. It must be nurtured and it must be protected. That's why we have small group Bible studies at our church. We want our folks to get together and learn the Word of God and study God's Word together so that there's depth to us. What we don't want as a church is to be 40 miles wide and 2 inches deep. We want our folks at Tate Creek to be grounded and rooted in the Word of God. We want you to know not only what you believe, but why you believe it. And the reason is, is because when our kids go to school and they're being taught the exact opposite of what they're hearing at church, what we don't want is for them to think somehow that these folks at the school must be right because they tell me that five days a week and I'm only hearing it for an hour at church. What we want is for our parents and our kids to understand what we believe and why we believe it and how do we respond when the world contradicts what we believe. So it's important that we're grounded and rooted, we're planted, we cultivate the Word, we nurture, we protect what God teaches us, much like a seed. Now, Jesus goes on to not only explain to us anyone who hears the Word of the kingdom doesn't understand it, then the evil one, referring to Satan, will snatch away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. That's that hard ground that had been trampled down as hard as concrete. Now verse 20 says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word. Now mark in your notes, immediately. This is the one that responds just immediately. It's the picture of someone in an emotional moment, just quickly responds out, out of this moment of emotion. And, and there's just, it just seems to be the thing to do at the moment. They, they immediately grab onto it. I want that. And they grab it. Jesus said they immediate, this is the picture of someone who immediately grabs onto it. They receive it with joy. Verse 21 says, yet they have no root in themselves, but they endure it for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, mark again, immediately he falls away. 
So Jesus has just told us that here's the picture of someone else who immediately quickly comes to Christ. Uh, they also just as quick leave. That's another picture. Now, we'll say more about that in a minute. Look at verse 22. And for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And I learned a long time ago that farmers don't have to sow seeds for weeds. They will come naturally. And so the Bible says that there are those who respond to the weeds. They are weeds Verse 23 said, and then as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. And so Jesus gives to us this picture of the seed and the sower now is the one who spreads the word. And, and that's the one who tells people what the word of God says. He has just taught us that the soil is the heart of someone who is listening to the Word. Now, I, I've been privileged this week to have a couple of people that gave me an opportunity to share the gospel with them. I was in a doctor's office, uh, obviously, <laughs> one day this week, and uh, the doctor uh, came to me after he'd, he'd been working with me for a little while, and he came into the room and he said, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be weird when I say this, but he said, you know, there's just something different about you. He, he said, I, I have a lot of people that come into my office, and he, and he said they complain and they gripe about everything, and, and, and just they're rude. And he said, there's something about your countenance. There's, there's just something about your disposition that, he said, I, I can tell there's something different about your life. And so I was able to talk to this doctor about Jesus. Yesterday, I went to an internationally renowned restaurant called McDonald's, <laughs> and I, I was there with my grandson, and he's playing on the playground. And uh, if you've ever done that, you know how exciting that is to sit there while the kids are on the playground. But anyway, this fellow just came right up to me, and he began to tell me about how that he has lung cancer and COPD, and, and the doctor told him he wouldn't live long. And so I was able to tell the story of my wife and how that she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and the doctor told her she wasn't going to live two or three months and that was six years ago. And I told him how that the doctor had told me that my wife blew his mind and by saying that um, he thought she was going to be dead in two or three months and here she is still alive after six years. And, and I told this gentleman, I said, you know, just because the doctor diagnosed you to die in a few months does not mean that's the way it's going to happen. I said, he can tell you the medical diagnosis, but God has the final say. Well, he takes a break from my sharing the gospel with him. Remember, he's got lung cancer and COPD, so he wanted to take a short break so he could go outside and smoke a cigarette real quick. So he went out and smoked one and came back in, and, and I continued to share with him about Jesus. Now, one of the things that is a reality Jesus says about talking about him, of spreading the word, of being a sower... One of the realities is you're going to come up to different types of soil. There's going to be different types of responses that you have when you talk to people about Jesus. I wish that everybody I talk to about Jesus would just come and say, I want him. I want this Jesus you're talking about. Wouldn't it be great if that happened? Wouldn't it be great if every time I preached that people were getting saved and people were running down the aisle, I want this Jesus you're talking about. I wish that happened every time I preach. And so Jesus said the reality is there's going to be different responses. When you talk to people about him, people will respond differently. And to illustrate that, he gave to us these four different kinds of soils or four different kinds of hearts they are going to respond to us when we talk to people about Jesus. So just be ready for it. Not everybody you talk to is going to get saved. But may I remind you that not everybody Jesus talked to gave their lives to Him. And so you're going to get different kinds of responses. The first one that Jesus referred to was the hard heart in verse 19. This is where He gave to us a picture of going down this path that's like concrete from so many people walking on it, and you put your seeds down on it, nothing's going to grow in it because the road, the path is so hard that it won't take root and grow. 
And so Jesus said, there's going to be times where you talk to people about Him, and they're not going to listen. I mean, their heart is hardened. Remember in context that He had just talked to us about what the unpardonable sin was? And how that it was possible for someone to so harden their heart that they can't, cannot listen to the Holy Spirit anymore. And so there's going to be people that you talk to about Jesus that are just going to be hard-hearted and they want nothing to do with what you're saying. He also says there's going to be some uh, in verses 20 and 21 that are what I call a shallow heart. These are the ones that respond quickly. These are the ones that in a moment of emotion, they jump up in excitement and they jump up with emotion and I want to do this. But Jesus said the first time trouble comes along, they leave as quickly as they came. Because they never really had received the Word into their heart. There had never been this planting of the Word of God to bring roots into their life. And so, just as they came with emotion, when the troubles came, they ran as quickly as they ran to you. And and that too is an improper response to Jesus. The third thing Jesus talked about in verse 22 was that busy heart. This is the one that Jesus says they are so given and they were so concerned about life and getting along with life that they're running to this place and they're running to that place and they're worried about how much money they're going to make and I don't have time for God because I've got to build a business. I don't have time to talk to you about Jesus because i got money to make. I build toward my retirement. I've got things i got to do. I, I preached this message in the early service, and one of our businessmen came to me after the service, and he said, Pastor, that's exactly the way I was before I gave my life to Jesus. He said, I was driving 2,000 miles a week as part of my job at one time. And, and I had no time for God. I had no time for Jesus. He said, you're right. He said, what you said about that was me. I was running everywhere trying to make money, running everywhere trying to build my business, and I had no time for God. And there are those that Jesus said are going to respond to us that way when we talk to them about their relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't have time for it. I'm too busy. i got too many things to do. Jesus said, be prepared. There's going to be folks who respond that way. I like what he says in verse 23, though. Because there he describes those who respond to him. He said that there will be those who hear God's word, and indeed their life bears fruit and it brings a yield. In some cases a hundredfold, in some sixty, and in some thirty. There's different fruit that you see. Not everybody produces the same fruit, but they produce fruit. Now how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're a child of God? Have you ever wondered that? Maybe not out loud because it's not the politically correct thing to say at church. But some people that attend church wonder sometimes, how can I truly know that I have been saved? How can I know that I'm a child of God? Well, first of all, it's always based on whether or not you have done what the Bible tells you to do in order to be saved. I ask folks who give their life to Jesus to turn to John chapter 1 and verse 12 that says, "...to as many as received Him..." To them he gave the right to become the children of God. And I tell them, now I want you to put today's date in the margin beside that verse. And every time you wonder whether or not you're a child of God, go back to that verse, read it, and say, oh, I did that on that date, so I know that I'm saved because the Bible tells me so. Jesus said there's another way you can tell if you're saved or not. The other way that you can tell if you're saved or not is because your life will produce fruit. Orange trees do not produce apples. Apple trees do not produce grapes. Oranges come from orange trees, apples from apple trees, and grapes from the vine. And so when you truly give your life to Jesus Christ, Jesus said there will be fruit in your life. I'm not saying that we're all perfect because we're not. But suddenly when you give your life to Jesus, there is change. This same lady that I spoke about earlier whose family member gave gave their life to Christ because she was wearing the cross. At the same time, she spoke about how that her family member looked at her and said, I've seen a change in your life. Your life is different. Your life has changed. And that's what happens when you give your life to Jesus. People around you can see a change. 
Suddenly the fruit of God is being seen in your life. We see in, in Galatians 5.22 the fruit of the Spirit. And those fruits like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. And all of these things begin to come out of your life. People begin to see God's holiness and God's goodness. When you used to be rude to people, suddenly you're kind. When you used to cuss at people, suddenly you're trying to encourage them. Where you used to, to be ugly, now you're, you're nice. And, and your life has begun to change. And people begin to see that. And Jesus said that the person who has given me their life and, and the seed of the Word of God has taken root in them, then you begin to see from them the fruit of Jesus. You begin to see Jesus in them. And so that's a beautiful picture there of what it means to have a fruitful heart. May I remind you that Jesus taught us too that the key to a fruitful heart is found in verse 9. When Jesus said, and this is why I ask you to mark the verse, in verse 9, He who has ears, let him hear. I want you to understand that Jesus was speaking in context to a group of people that were hearing His words, but they really weren't hearing what He was saying. Understand what I mean? There are times where you might audibly hear me speaking, but totally miss what I'm saying. I know that through the years of being a pastor, that there's been a lot of times where someone has come to me after I've preached the message, and they said, you said this or that in a sermon. And, well, I didn't say that. Where do you get that? I've heard, I've heard other people talk about something another pastor said, and that's not what they said. And so one of the things we have to be careful with is are you just hearing the words or are you truly hearing what's being said? There's a huge difference. How often do we go to church and we sing along and we listen to the preacher, but we haven't really heard what was said? Probably more than we're willing to admit. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to really hear what I'm saying. Remember, he's speaking to a bunch of religious people who have denied him as the Savior of the world. They've denied him being God. And he's saying, you need to listen to what I'm saying. You need to truly hear what Jesus is saying. Salvation does not come through religion. Salvation does not come by following a bunch of rules and regulations and involving yourself in ceremonies. Faith in Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with Him is what brings life into us. That's receiving the seed of the Word of God. Jesus is the one that produces life. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so if you want life, as he teaches this crowd that he was talking to in chapter 13, it's not about religion. It's not about your ceremonies and rules. It's about personal relationship with me. So if you have ears to hear, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm teaching you about life and finding life. Here is used in just this chapter alone. It's used 19 times. And so you don't think it's important that Jesus wants you to hear what he's saying? Listen to what Jesus is saying to your heart. The bottom line of the question is this. Has there ever been a time in your life when you have received Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior? Or am I speaking to someone that you're not listening to one thing I'm saying? You're hearing me, but you're not listening to what I'm saying. What I am just said fell on rocky or, or on a path of concrete. Maybe you're like, well, oh, I'll do it. I feel emotional right now. I'll grab onto it. And then the first time problems comes, we don't see you again. Maybe you're like the, like the other fellows that Jesus talked about that says, I don't have time for that. I'm, I'm trying to build a business. I'm trying to build my retirement. i got things to buy for my kids. I don't want them doing without. And you never see the kids because you spend all of your life trying to provide for them, but you never really invest in them because of it. And so you don't commit your life to Christ because you're too busy for Him. Who is listening to this message that needs Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Hear what Jesus is saying. You need to pay attention that you do hear. Pay attention to the, that I hear what Jesus, what is Jesus saying to me in this message. Pay attention to what you hear. One of the dangers that we have in life is that the Bible describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. 
And so be careful that between my mouth and your ears that Satan doesn't twist in the air what the Word of God is saying to your heart. Be careful what you hear. And be also be careful how you hear. That it's not just on the surface, but that it's in the heart that you listen to what God's trying to say to you. Now one last thing that's really, really important for you. The response to Jesus Christ does not depend on the sower. The response to Jesus Christ does not depend on the seed. The response to Jesus Christ depends on the soil. And that's the one who's listening. It depends on you. The Bible teaches us that God created us in His image. And as a part of being in the image of God, God has placed within us a will. That means we can choose to follow Him or choose to reject Him. It's either obedience or disobedience. It's either belief or unbelief. It's either receive Him or reject Him. It's that simple. But God loved you enough. It's out of the love of God that He has given to you an opportunity to choose whether to walk with Him or not. Had God just said, you got to do this and you got to do that, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, then it becomes a robotic thing and the response is not out of love. Your response to Him is out of obligation because He told you to do it. That's not how God chose for us to respond to Him. God said that He has given to us, He's made us in His image. We can receive Him or we can reject Him. We can believe in Him or there can be unbelief. We can obey Him or we can disobey Him. But when we respond to Him, then we're coming to Him in love. Not out of compulsion, but we respond to Him with love. And there's a huge difference and the response is up to you. If I could choose for you, I would come out there and do it. If I could choose for my children the life that they choose and their walk with Jesus, I would choose it for them, but I cannot. If I could choose for my grandchildren, I would do that, but I cannot. They have to make, at some point in their life, they have to make that choice for themselves. Same thing with you. You've had the opportunity, you've heard enough today about Jesus that will absolutely change your life if you're willing to receive him into your heart. And I mean commit your life to Him. I'm not talking about shunning Him. I'm not talking about just in a moment of emotion say, I want that. I'm not talking about you saying, oh, I'm too busy for God. I'm talking about are you genuinely at the point where you will say, I want Jesus as my Savior. I commit my life to Him. And I want His Word to take root in my heart and change my life. I've seen it happen many times where people have done that. And it's so beautiful to watch what Jesus does in someone's life and to watch Him change people. And He will do the same for you right now. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank You for Your Word, for the seed of God's Word. And Father, we realize it's so important how we respond to the Word Father, whoever's listening to this message, wherever they are, not only whether they're in their home, a business, in their car, or here in the auditorium, wherever we are, even in our lives, what's going on with us, problems with drugs or alcohol, domestic problems, fighting with our husband and wife, or, or Father, just having trouble in life, or, or we've lost our jobs, or what, wherever we are in life, Father, I pray that we would receive Jesus into our hearts and lives, that we would see this opportunity right now to receive the seed of God's Word and to commit our lives to Jesus Christ where that Word might take root in us and that you would produce the fruit of Jesus in our lives and that others would see Jesus in us. I pray that my life would mirror Jesus that when people look at me, they will not see me, but they will see Jesus. Oh, that is my prayer, precious Father. That your word would always take root in my life. And that the world would see the fruit that you produce. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Listen.